All right, hey class. So we're gonna be talking about the Cold War today. Uh, we're not gonna be talking about the whole war itself. So the whole war itself lasted about 44 years. Um, we're mainly gonna be, gonna be talking about the first 13 years or so. And then we're gonna talk about the arms race and space race uh, next week. So we're, gonna we're not gonna cover the whole thing, but I just want you to know the date, just so we're clear on, on how long this lasted. And 1991, it ended mainly because Soviet Union dissolved, ceased to exist. That was supposedly the end of the Cold War, all right? Although many argue we're still living in a Cold War today, but that's up to interpretation. But let's get started. All right. So the first thing I wanna uh, note here is that the Cold War was never fought physically between the United States and the Soviet Union. It was always an ideological struggle, struggle between the Soviets and the US, communism, pro-communism or anti-communism, all right? So the Soviets of the Eastern Bloc nations formed the Iron Curtain of Europe and their goal was to spread communism. The United States and the Western democracies, their goal was to contain communism, right? Containment and hope for the eventual collapse of the communist world. So numerous ways in which this, this war was fought. It was fought through espionage, spying on each other, gathering intelligence, an arms race, building up the, the the arms, right? The nuclear capabilities of each nation, right? And the competition to, to gain the minds and hearts of people in the quote, third world. So those in Vietnam, those in Korea, those in Africa, those in Latin America and South America, right? And these were fought through proxy wars, all right? Um, not necessarily the United States or the Soviet Union, but people within these areas of the world, like in Africa and Korea, who held either to the idea of spreading communism or containing communism. All right, but mainly we're going to be talking about the, at least for most of this lecture here, the bipolarization of Europe, NATO versus the Warsaw Pact. Okay. So after World War II ends, uh, Europe's divided into two. Uh, East Europe and West Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, to really want to call it, right? And Winston Churchill in 1946 famously declared that an iron curtain had descended upon Europe. And this iron curtain is this imaginary line that's dividing Eastern Europe and Western Europe. All right. And the beginnings of the Cold War, the seeds are planted when Harry Truman, President Harry Truman, declares in 1947 that the United States is going to step away from being a neutral country into supporting free people throughout the world and resisting any takeovers by armed minorities or outside pressures. He means the Soviet Union in this case. And he does this by giving $400 million in aid to Greece and Turkey, mainly because the civil war starts in Greece. Okay. So that's the Truman Doctrine, um, basically getting into other countries' affairs. And a lot of people in the United States didn't like this, but Congress passed this, this um, aid bill of giving $400 million, right? And that leads to something called the Marshall Plan. So all of Western Europe is ruined after World War II, economic turmoil, scarcity of jobs and food, and the Secretary of State, Georgia Marshall, proposes that the United States needs to give aid to European countries. Otherwise, the Soviets and communists are gonna try to win the hearts and minds of these people. So the Congress passes a bill, 12.5 billion in 1948, and it's a tremendous success because Europe gets this enormous amount of aid and they're able to rebuild quicker uh, than Eastern Europe, all right? So, that's part of the reason why you see in the world today more um, prosperity in Western Europe, we could say. Eastern Europe uh, has still some, some lingering issues of the Cold War, um, but the Marshall Plan is, uh, it could be attributed to the Marshall Plan. Okay. So the Cold War, um, one of its fam more famous episodes and really where it all kicks off is in Berlin, in Germany, in, in Eastern Germany, let's say, right? Because that's where Berlin is, all right? But after World War II, Germany is split into four zones, all right? Number one, the British zone. Number two, the French zone. Number three, the American zone. And number four, the Soviet zone. Okay. And the Soviet zone is what 
comes to be known as East Germany. And the three other zones held by the Allies is eventually known as West Germany. Berlin is interesting because West Berlin is controlled by the Allies. East Berlin is controlled by the Soviets. All right. So what ends up happening is that once um, France, Britain, and the United States decide that they're not going to hold West Germany under military control, they give a little bit of freedom to West Germany and they allow them to, to build their country again to, to make sure that they can stand on their own two feet instead of having crutches with them. So these occupational zones become a one country, West Germany, and the Soviets were not happy with this. The reason why is that they wanted to keep countries like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Austria, uh, East Germany weak so that the Soviets could control them, right? Because the Soviets clearly, like any country, wants to stay around forever. So by keeping them weak, they look strong, all right? So the Soviets were kind of intimidated by this. Um, so what they did is that they ended up blocking Berlin. There was, so there, used to, there is a stretch of road. Um, that's the reason why it's West Berlin here that leads from West Germany to Berlin. So that's blocked off and they're all alone. So they're going to starve to death. They're going to they're gonna basically perish without any support. So what the Allies do is they decide that they're going to take a little bit of a gamble here and not surrender West Berlin. So they're going to do a little airlift here, right, of supplies, foods, goods, and whatnot. So literally what the Allies would do is that they would, they would stock up in these planes every single day, um, every single, well, not every single hour, um, but what are they Seven, eight times a day, and they would prepare this, and they would send food, supply thousands of pounds of food, by the way, to these people in West Berlin. That helped them for about two years. And once the Soviets saw that they couldn't really stop this, because if they attacked a the plane, then obviously it would start a war, they decided to give up and just let West Berlin continue as is. All right. So this was a major victory for the Allies, a major victory. It kind of showcased the the power of being united and the democracy and the evils of communism, all right? So that's the way the story goes. But if if you decide to study the Cold War more on your own, you'll see that the United States may not necessarily be the good guy here. But that's what happens. Um, that's the, the Berlin blockade and the Berlin airlift, all right? So the first four years of the Cold War up until 1949, the first two years, whenever you think it starts, the U.S. was able to successfully contain and stop the spread of communism in Europe. All right. So that um, Iron Curtain that Winston Churchill mentioned, this ends up being Eastern Europe pro-communist up until the 90s and today. So that's, that, this is the state of Europe by 1949. All right. It's divided into two. And the world, um, well, I should say the Western world, is divided into two camps. There's NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is led by the United States and includes countries like Belgium, Britain, Canada, Denmark, France, etc. And then there's the Warsaw Pact, which is led by the Soviet Union and includes countries like Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, and Romania. So it's an alliance system. There's an understanding here that if the USSR decides to attack the Netherlands, the United States is going to help out the Netherlands and so will all these countries, right? So it's kind of a World War I scenario again, where if a country attacks another, it could possibly lead to war. Right. Uh, I'm going to go by this fast, so let's take a look here. So Joseph Stalin dies in the early 1950s. He's succeeded by this guy, Premier Nikita Khrushchev. All right, and he gives a famous speech basically saying that he's gonna bury the United States and all the democratic countries and communism will prevail because history is on his side, right? That's up to interpretation, but clearly it didn't work out, all right? And the Cold War kicks off with a bunch of proxy wars and revolutions going on around the world. So number one, Mao Zedong's revolution in 1949, China becomes a communist power. The Korean War takes place. Uh, North Korea is pro-communist. South Korea is anti-communist and gets the help of the United States and Great Britain, uh, but it ends up in a draw. So this is the beginning of the Korea we see today, North Korea, South Korea, division at the 38th parallel. And the idea of the domino theory. Well, this is mainly a US theory that if one country falls to communism, all countries will. So the United States 
has this obsession eventually with stopping communism. Suez crisis takes place. The Hungarian uprising happens. The U-2 spy incident where a spy is caught in, in Soviet airspace leads to heavy criticism and, and even more suspicion from the Soviets. Although Khrushchev and eventually later President John F. Kennedy uh, do meet up, it's still a very tense in the 1960s. All right. And this is all followed up with uh, the creation of the Berlin Wall in 1961. So the Berlin Wall is what it sounds like. It's a wall in Berlin, and it's dividing Berlin in half, East Berlin and West Berlin. So the reason why the, so the Soviets decided to build this wall was to stop people from East Germany and East Berlin going into West Berlin so that they could defect to the Allies, right? The United States, uh, the pro-democracy world, the anti-communist world. So they built a wall at first, it was pretty simple, but eventually they started adding more things, they started adding barbed wire, higher fences, guards. Uh, you had to cross land, and if you weren't careful, you would step on a mine. Guards could shoot you if they caught you. So it was pretty serious. And the Berlin Wall ends up um, symbolizing the division between the two worlds. It ends up symbolizing... Eastern Europe being pro-communist and Western Europe being pro or anti-communist, pro-democracy. Pro right? And the Berlin Wall doesn't fall until 1989. So it's, it's up there for over 20 years. Families, of course, were separated and it would be a while before they would see each other. And unfortunately, there were some who couldn't either because of old age or other circumstances, but it's the Berlin Wall. And John F. Kennedy took Great offense to this. He ended up visiting Berlin in 1963 and he reassured West Berlin and West Germany that the West was with them, that the United States, Great Britain, France, they were all in it together. And he famously declared that, Ich am a Berliner. I am a Berliner in 1963. Although Ich mich ein Berliner, I'm not sure if this is right or not, could also mean I am a jelly donut. I remember one of my teachers uh, telling me that that's what it actually means. Whether it's true or not, who knows? If John F. Kennedy said he was a jelly donut, who are the Berliners to say no? All right. 1949 to 1970, the Cold War um, escalates. And here's a, a better representation of what's going on around the world. So you've got numerous conflicts going on, North Korea, Afghanistan, the Vietnam War, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the Chilean Revolution, East Germany, like we talked about. So the Cold War is going on all over the world. The hotspots are really Asia, Africa, and the Middle East because they're neutral countries, all right? And obviously they're closer to the Soviet Union, so the Soviets are going to want to have more control over that area. But the fear, the paranoia, the, the mindset that a lot of Americans take during the Cold War is due to the arms race that follows in 1949 after the Berlin Agreement. The arms race is essentially a nuclear arms race, trying to see the USA and the US, USSR trying to flex and see who's got the, the bigger muscle in terms of, of nuclear weapons. All right. The US in 1949, I thought they were all high and mighty, right? They thought, we're the only country with the atomic bomb, we're the only country with this technology, the USSR needs to fear us. That all changes when the USSR successfully tests their own atomic bomb, though. Now, how did they end up making their atomic bomb? It's pretty easy. They sent spies in the US, they gained the documents, uh, the scientific um, protocols, or whatever you want to call it, to make the bomb. So that's how they ended up developing it. Got a little clip here to show you just how strong the atomic bomb for the Soviets is.
So eyes do not deceive. That was a mushroom cloud. All right. So um, the Americans are absolutely terrified of what they've witnessed, what they're seeing, what they're reading. The Soviets have a nuclear, the, the technology to build a nuclear weapon at their disposal. Um, so two nuclear superpowers are in the world now, the USSR and the Soviet Union. All right. There's a race now. Who can make a bomb that's stronger? The USA tested their first hydrogen bomb in 1952, and a hydrogen bomb is a thousand times stronger than the atomic bomb, a whole lot stronger. I'm not sure about a thousand times, but it's definitely stronger. And again, the US thought they had the upper hand, but the Soviets ended up building their own hydrogen bomb in 1953. So, once again, I've got a clip here to show you just how strong is the hydrogen bomb. understand Russian excellent job if not um, the subtitle over there for you but the point is that the hydrogen bomb was is extremely powerful today I imagine it's way more powerful than, than what we saw there um, so if you saw the the little the little shed there getting disintegrated remember that um, because the United States has ends up making a protocol of what happens when an, if a nuclear bomb is ever dropped on a city um, now, their idea of safety and protection is a bit funny, but we'll look at that next week. All right. Anyways, by 1959, both the United States and the USSR developed rockets called intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs. And these could deliver nuclear warheads to distant targets. Okay. Um, so here's a map of just how, how far these ICBMs could go. All right. Now up to this line here is a medium-sized ICBM. So imagine a longer one. Could extend all the way over here. All right. So those ICBMs are no joke. Um, they can travel pretty far. All right. And so by 1950 to 1960, uh, President Eisenhower, who was the president at the time, um, escalated the Cold War by using something called brinksmanship. All right, threatening to use nuclear weapons and this idea that each country was willing to go to the brink of war all right, to defend their ideology. All right. So it goes back to NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Right? If the USSR attacked a NATO member, the US uh, would use massive retaliation, attack every major Soviet city and military target, and vice versa with the USSR. So this era of the Cold War was also an era of brinksmanship. All right? Each country, even though they were afraid to go to war, would not be will not stop, will not stop it if, if they were ever attacked, all right? 
So to prepare for this, the USA and the USSR began stockpiling nuclear weapons and building up their militaries. So take a look. The USA in 1987 had about 25,000 nuclear warheads, the Soviets 37,000. ICBMs, they each had more than 1,000. Okay, so um, clearly they were building up their militaries in the 30 year gap between them. So this causes fear and paranoia in the public and it leads to a lot of protocols being made, a lot of songs being written, a lot of books being written, movies being produced, all right? So while it was the era of the Cold War, it was also a mad era, a mutually assured destructive era. All right. So what's mad? Mutually assured destruction. Basically, each country had the understanding that if they ever attacked each other, they would go to war. Hence, mutually assured destruction. Okay. And the idea was to avoid this at all cost, but they still had to be prepared, right? Because you never know what could happen, all right? So here's just one song uh, made during the era that highlights the Cold War. So it's by Al Rex. It's called Hydrogen Bomb, so it gives it away. And it's very upbeat, high tempo. Um, I feel like only the United States could make a song like this about something so scary. Yeah, make a song so um, addictive. So let's give a little listen. So, a hydrogen bomb indeed. That's what people were afraid of, all right? People were also afraid of a little satellite called Sputnik 1 in 1957. We'll talk about this next week, though. So, we're done here talking about the basics of the Cold War. Next week, let's jump into some specifics here. The space race, all right? How does the space race come to symbolize what the Cold War is? We'll find that out next week. All right. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to be here, for being present. Uh, take the quiz now. If you've done the readings, excellent. Make sure you do those before you take the quiz. All right. But thank you. All right. Have a good weekend. If you have any questions, please email me.